Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the State of Mind podcast. On the show, we have a guest. His name is Mafuz Chadhuri. Is that That's right? Very good. That awesome. was very wicked, good. Wicked. Okay. <laughs> I think are we doing a bit of a double whammy here, or yeah, something yeah, like that. Let's um, let's share each other's story. Okay. I think this would be awesome. This is we've. Uh, we met at um, a recent event, and we talked about very similar stuff. So this is a good opportunity for us to pour that in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, we met at a event put on at York Mills Collegiate by a business class. It was really cool. And actually something that I guess outside of here I'm working on a lot is helping teachers and schools develop curriculum that can happen within the school to learn about mental health and mm. et cetera. And they did an awesome job. Actually, I'm curious, how did they, I think you may have told me, but how did you How did you connect with them or how did they find you? So this was really cool where I've had uh, colleagues that I've worked with in the past and they had opportunities to speak at that school. I think that school does the event wow. every year during okay. the uh, Mental Health Awareness Week. Yeah. And um, they recommended me. One of my colleagues has seen me speak in the past and they brought me into it. This was interesting because, number one, you have a very diverse group in the audience. Like you have different age range, uh, different personality types, but also the conversation on the topic, right? It's like, it's fun to get up on stage and talk about marketing for hours. Like that's my thing. But uh-huh. when they're like, can you come up and talk about mental health awareness and how you deal with it with this loud environment? I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, how do you feel about that kind of audience? Because I'm used to speaking to business owners, yeah. <laughs> um, usually someone that's uh, maybe migrating from college to the workforce. But how do you feel with your experience? I think you do that a lot, right? Yeah. Um, it can be... It's weird because once the most important thing I think is getting into their world as not, I don't want to say as quickly as possible, but the sooner you can show them that you're not just another person there trying to give them a lecture Mm. or tell them what they should or shouldn't be doing. um, The sooner that connection can be made, the better because they're so guarded against adults and other people telling them what to do because they're so used to it all the time. Um, when, and you can see it instantly once they let that guard down, they start, they pay attention and they're really with you. Um, so that's how it's gone most of the time. And to be quite honest, it's really, I mean, I've, I don't know how many times I've been in front of large groups of teenage kids or even younger, at least a hundred times, but sure. I don't think I've ever really had disrespectful audience. And it's pretty amazing. Like the teachers, it's so funny to see. So when the kids start getting a bit restless, the teachers start barking at them, right. you know, stop doing that and listen. And they come and they get all. And I, whenever I can, if I have the opportunity, I ask the teachers to let me deal with the. I like that. Yeah. Like you deal with the noise. Yeah. Keep things in order. Yeah. That's really cool. And it's so funny that you say that because there'll be often times when I speak at high schools where I'll be up on the stage and while I'm speaking, yeah. I see the teacher running across yeah. trying to quiet down a student on <laughs> yeah, the other yeah. side. Um, so it, it's like, do I keep going? Should I comment uh-huh, on it? Uh-huh. It's strange. But um, I like what you pointed out there, which is the difference between someone that is getting lectured by someone who is their parent uh, figure almost in that environment as a teacher. Yet you're coming up, and I remember seeing you speak for the first time that day, and I loved I loved the approach that you took there because you went up on stage saying, hey, I've been there too. I was there, and I've fought my way out of it, and I just want to share with you how. and. Everyone in the audience was kind of sitting back saying, wow, I can relate to him. I feel like this guy is one of us rather than the adult that's yelling right. and barking at us. So yeah. I love the fact that you took that approach in the story. I can tell you've done it. You've you've worked with that kind of audience a lot in the past because you knew how to kind of migrate through it. You actually won me over the second I went up before you and <laughs> I had this giant spotlight in my eyeballs. I was like burning through my skull. <laughs> and I remember very quickly saying like, hey, can we do something about the light? And then like by some miracle, the light dims in, and I see you up there like I got you. So so yeah, awesome. you won me over right away. But man, your your story is so powerful and um, I enjoy hearing about it, and I know you've probably shared it on the show before, but I'd love for, whether it's a new audience or people that are mm-hmm. listening from my background, I'd love for them to hear a little bit about your, your upbringing. Sure. Um, 
you, you beat me to the punch. So <laughs> someone had to ask. Yeah, this is what so. happens when you put two podcast yes, hosts in the yeah. same room. By the way, <laughs> just no one knows who to ask and answer. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, how do I make a long story short? I mean, both my parents come from unique back. I mean, I don't know if it's unique. So my mom has seven sisters or had um, my and she grew up in Whitby, Ontario, which at the time was like a farming community. And my dad is uh, a Jewish guy who grew up in post-war London. And his two older sisters are 14 and 16 years older or 12. And so he was kind of I don't, like not a mistake kid, you know, but sure. And so when he was about five years old, my grandma was like, I can't do this anymore. And she sent him to boarding school. So he basically grew up by himself, uh, you know, for the most part, sure. from five, six years old, which I can't fathom what that mm-hmm. was like. Um, And so, you know, I don't know. That sort of, I guess, my mom fighting for independence and space and my dad being forced to be independent influenced their behavior and who they are, their personalities. And then uh, I have an older brother. We had a relatively normal upbringing, if you will, whatever that means. Uh, they, My parents got divorced when I was pretty young, about five or six. And then um, I got into using drugs really young um, because I it was the first time I could ever change how I felt inside, basically. Interesting. So I could put things in my body and change how I felt. So that, I mean, that's the primary reason for drug use, basically. It's like we have an internal pain or suffering or trauma, whatever it is, uh, and we don't know how to make it go away or how to cope with it, and drugs become a wonderful solution to that mm. because it's kind of a quick fix, right? Sure. But the yeah. more the more you rely on it, the more you become dependent on it, and then it just becomes this horrible cycle. Of, Gosh, yeah, yeah, it's awful. And so, we never talked about mental health back then. And the, I don't know if you, uh, how old are you again? I just turned thirty three today. Okay, cool. Yeah. So what? That's eighty five. Is that eighty six? Eighty six. Yeah. Amazing. So I'm eighty one. So you may have or may not have seen them, but the the don't do drugs commercials when I was younger <laughs> were like. They would crack an egg in a frying pan, right? And be like, don't. This is your brain this on This is your drugs. mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I can't remember when <laughs> you – I, I want to hear yeah. later because I don't remember – I remember you describing your your history, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know when you came to Canada, et cetera. But, so I don't know if you would have been around to see those commercials or not when you were little. I mean with, you can find anything on YouTube these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> promise you I spend the better part of my time <laughs> looking them up. But yeah, the the whole like this is your brain in this environment yeah, is yeah, the yeah, funniest yeah. thing ever. <laughs> that was their like campaign. Like they yeah, really yeah, thought yeah, back yeah. then that would be the social impact that yeah. would make people change. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I even noticed that with uh, cigarette commercials now where they tried that for a while. where saying like, hey, smoking hurts you. Right. Now they're taking the approach of saying – smoking hurts people around you. And I thought that was interesting, saying that if you're not cool, going to yeah, think for yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. and right. you don't care about your own health, what about the people that you're affecting as a result of it? So that was an interesting approach. That is really interesting. And I can't remember where in, I'm studying right now. And so I was reading recently about <clears throat> excuse me, how easy it is for us to deceive ourselves. So smoking is a great example. We know it's not good for us. We know it's whatever. But we just make these rationalizations and justifications for right. for it, and then it just sort of we push it aside as not. But oop, look at that! I didn't do my due diligence. <laughs> Wasn't I the one that walked mind? in and said, <laughs> "Put our phone on silent"? That's all right. We, you know, we've yeah, uh, we've right. all done that yes. once upon a time. So oh that's my cool. god! Um, I had that happen in this corporate thing I was doing. It was really bad. It started ringing. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so yeah, the approach to don't you know don't do drugs, et cetera, and how we deceive ourselves. And so another horrible thing about drug addiction or you know substance use addiction is the intense denial and the lying that goes on right. to the self. And so that was huge for me. And some one person in particular, a girlfriend I had when I was younger, she was trying to tell me how messed up I was getting. And uh, 
I just couldn't listen to her. I was too young and immature. It's so hard when you're a kid to yeah. get a big and bird's eye view of what actually the world is like mm-hmm. and et cetera. And so that was hard. And my brother, um, around that time, a few years later, developed schizophrenia because he used a lot of drugs too. And so it speaks a little bit to the family history, genetic makeup, makeup of people. And you never know sort of who's more vulnerable than others. But the one thing for sure is that if you have family history of it, then sure. it's likely to happen to you. And my grandfather died by suicide, one of them. Wow. So, Gosh. It's, you know, had we talked about any of this stuff way back when, um, when my brother and even myself, like I was convicted of trafficking marijuana in grade 11. So, but there was never any, you know, is there something wrong with you, Michael? Like, mm-hmm. Do you want any help? You know, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I lied a lot about. You try to justify it even to yourself. Oh, right. And yeah, 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 like yeah. that environment, you make emotional decisions, but you try to rational, rationalize it by saying this is why I'm doing it and it's OK. Mm-hmm, and it's interesting mm-hmm. that you say like there wasn't a lot of things, uh, a lot of resources or a lot of people speaking about this being a common thing. So sometimes yeah. you probably felt like you were the only one that were going through it and you didn't think that there was someone else that could relate. Yeah, it's right. weird. So I, it's, I don't yeah. even know that for sure. That was definitely when my brother was getting really sick. That was one thing that was super hard because we had a huge – so one nice thing about growing up here in the 80s <laughs> – my God, I'm so old – or the <laughs> 90s, I guess, even, is that the city was still relatively small. You know what I mean? So yeah. small, you know, in a in a present-day context. And so our social circles spanned across the city quite a long way. Right. So we knew so many – and it, it's really fortunate, too. Today it's fortunate because – you know, knowing people in lots of different places in the workplace or whatever. I mean, that's part of the reason I ended up in this radio station uh, is just this huge social circle. But what made that so hard when my brother was getting really sick was, you know, the gossip and the stigma and whatever that was going around about Mm -hmm. what a weirdo, you know, he was and what his behavior was and all this other stuff. So that made it quite awkward and uncomfortable for me which led to that feelings of being alone and isolated and that kind of stuff and it it just sort of fed that slow downward spiral into misery and despair it doesn't get better yeah right there's no no support system yeah yeah and particularly for him and for my family and etc it's gotten a little bit better now but you know people that live with psychotic related illnesses like schizophrenia there's very little help you know even in the you know cam h is like supposed to be this world-class hospital but even there there's not that much support for people like that so yeah you know we've come a long way another thing about my grandfather is he had a lobotomy which is they cut your brain open and do surgery on your brain so that was in the 50s so what that's in history that's yesterday but in the span of the mental health system, it's not that long ago. So we've come such a long way, but at mm-hmm. the same time, still so much yeah, to go. Yeah. yeah, still so much to go. Yeah. I mean, it's. Um, I've only, I would say, in the last few years, have started seeing some kind of an initiative. Be it like the Bell Let's Talk approach, be it mm-hmm. some of the organizations. But I get excited now when I see high schools are getting involved with actually throwing events around the idea of mental health awareness. Um, it's just not talked about in the workplace when someone is going through it. It just looks like they're having a bad day and they'll get over it. But there's just so much not being talked about, which is really why it's exciting for me when I see the the evolution of Starts With Me, right? Like mm-hmm. I love the approach there. And I can imagine that a lot of your upbringing probably fueled you in why you're now doing something that you felt was a void out in the community that no one else was talking about. Yeah, for sure. I don't know um, how to sort of I always want, so one thing, which is another reason I ended up here, I always desperately wanted to be part of the world in a sense. I get it. Yeah. And when I went to university, I was so fascinated by, I started sort of was studying civics and politics. And that was when the 9-11 attacks happened. And and so I was so fascinated by global affairs and at my school which is one of the most politically active schools in Canada. It was really intense. And so I, I, 
I actually so because I was so unwell, I started to get angry and isolated and and sort of catastrophizing everything, which wasn't helpful. But what I sincerely wanted was to engage in the world, and I had all these really amazing people that I met from uh, a lot of them from the Middle East and a lot of them from uh, I guess it was Eastern Europe, and we just had so many amazing conversations sure. and, and just exploring the world and what the hell was going on and all this stuff. And, uh, it just never, I was never able to engage beyond that. And then, so when I, in my early twenties after school, I was involved in some community, uh, advocacy, I guess you would call it, or just engagement in the city. And so I remember when this radio station opened probably around 15 years ago. I don't know exactly, but, uh, and I had some friends that were doing incredible work in the city who now have almost legacies behind them, That's you know, incredible. in their mid thirties. And I could just, and I always had opportunities to get involved with them, but I was just such a mess that I just never mm-hmm. could. And so that hurt me so much too, because it, the person we usually hurt the most is ourself. And then it's that, continually failing to meet up to your expectation or to your desire of, I don't want to be like this. It's horrible, but I don't know how to stop. Wow. Yeah. And that was sort of the, oh, and so that's sort of in some ways how I got back into here was I got invited to the youth radio channel. I can't remember exactly how it mm-hmm. happened, but then here I am now, which is nice. And, and you're, you're now operating your own show. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's it's getting well. you an opportunity to get on the microphone and share thoughts on a, for, on a longer period of time. Yeah. I always found that challenging with uh, speaking on stage sometimes because you're giving a, you're given a time slot. Yeah. Sometimes it's 45 minutes. Sometimes it's less. Yeah. And you realize that it's very difficult to compress the key <laughs> messages in that short period of time. It's so hard, I mean, the yeah. event that we did, I think we were, I think we were given 10 minutes. Yeah. Sure. And I it, think they said 10 to 12 right? minutes. And, yeah. and, and I get it because it's it was a short event and there was a series of speakers. But mm-hmm. as a speaker, the challenge was how do I share a bigger message in a shorter period of time with a younger group of individuals that may not realize how big of an issue this is, that it needs to be talked about. Yeah. So we're both trying to give compressed versions of our stories, and it was tough. So I love the approach of a radio show where you're in charge of navigating and deciding how you want to share the conversation and for how long yeah. and for how, how frequently. You could mm-hmm. do it every week, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. it becomes interesting. Now, before uh, we segue away, and I know you want me to share my story. I so. Do. Um, I'm very engaged with what you're talking about right now. So before we break away yeah. from that, I think it's important to let the individuals know where the turning point was, right? We talked a lot about yeah. the challenges. We talked about um, your need for some resources that you just weren't finding out there. What is it that you did to bounce back from such a difficult time? Yeah. Uh, before I forget, I want to say it out loud too. I wanted to ask you uh, from a marketing perspective, yeah. uh, your your view on the Bell Let's Talk stuff and how – the sort of what can be perceived as a contradictory message in a sense, you know, Bell, this big multinational yeah. corporation, blah, 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 um, versus, oh, let's talk about mental health. Because uh, I think more so than ever this year, there was a lot of backlash against sure. them for that. So I yeah. don't know what, you know, what do you think about that? Pros, cons, bigger picture stuff, all uh, that. Yeah, I mean, when, when the Bell Let's Talk um, week has wrapped up, I started thinking a lot about who the individuals were that were behind the campaign. And something that kept crossing my mind was why Bell decided to put the word Bell in Let's Talk, right? They could have approached it with just saying Let's Talk, and that could have been their initiative. Why did they feel the need to put their company's brand on the hashtag in order to re- reaffirm that Bell is behind it? And And although that bothered me a bit, I also started thinking a lot about how much I've seen people talk more about mental health awareness than they've ever had. Some people may be doing it for their own reasons, for the purpose of um, you know, wanting to be part of the conversation, maybe for their own personal PR mm-hmm. to feel good that they're part of the conversation. And some people may actually be doing it genuinely to um, try to keep the conversation going. So as much as there's a part of me that says, do you need to really brand yourself to get yourself out there? Is that a marketing tactic? I also think a lot about maybe it was critical for a company the size of Bell 
to be able to run this initiative because of the funding, the major funding that goes behind it, the massive donation that's made at the end of it. So I give them more, you know, I'm optimist. I'm, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the yeah. world. And when I see situations like that, I like to think of what good is coming out of the bad. And there may be situations where it's making the company look better, but I also think is the world winning more as a result of it? Is more money going to the right people as a result of it? And if, it, if the trade-off is Bell gets a bit more acknowledgement behind being behind this initiative, I'm okay with that. I support that fully. Um, I think the conversation needs to be be had. Yeah. And I like that it's happening more than it's ever had. I made a post about it. And even while I was making the post, I asked myself, am I really doing this for the right reasons? And I made the post more about continuing the conversation after Bell Let's Talk ends rather than just making a post for that day. So here we are today continuing that conversation. So I'm yeah. very excited to keep that going. Nice. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective and really helpful too. I think people, I, <laughs> I always try to relate it back to individual psychology in a sense because Bell, let's talk, I guess, is a reflection of all of our internal. I mean, the world is a reflection of all our combined internal yes. reference points. So how to personally to maintain my own sanity <laughs> having that positive or more optimistic perspective ha is essential for me because otherwise it i really spiral is. off yeah. yeah i mean i when i look at the city and you know i was i was just out in toronto a couple of weeks ago and it inspired me to talk about this a bit more in in future conversations but you know, when you look around the city, everything that you see in that city was created as a contribution through human beings that wanted the city to grow, right? What is Toronto if people weren't involved with bringing it mm -hmm. to life? Like, where are the lights coming in from? Where are the businesses forming? Where are the homes being created? Who had the vision of creating the city and mapping it out the way it was? Who has done the events that brings the cultures together? There's just so much that's happening in the city. And I think everyone is always going to get some sort of backlash because there'll always be someone that's yeah. pessimist about <laughs> the circumstance and they'll they'll bash it saying, oh, you're just doing it for your own benefit. You're just doing this to make the city look better and all this stuff. But let's talk about the benefits, right? Let's talk about how much we've grown and evolved as a city and a community. I mean, we're the most diverse place in the entire world. That's yeah, unbelievable. In the entire yeah, world, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here we are, you know, having this kind of conversation today. I don't think in many countries I'd be able to sit beside someone like you and have this kind of conversation conversation. Yeah. So I'm excited about where the future is headed. And although there are many things that are scaring us and warning us, I like to think about how much I can control and how much I try to control. And the rest of it, it's you just got to come in with a positive perspective of helping out other people along the way. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's and, poetry, man. <laughs> yeah, that is poetry. Because it's one thing to be able to say that, but it's also it's a whole nother thing to really sort of embody that and practice that because it's oh it's it's years in training yeah for and, sure and sometimes it's and difficult you have days i'm sure where bad it, days yeah, yeah where it's and, not that and imagine the people easy. who had bad years how hard it is for them yeah. to see the world from a positive light yeah. and you know i wanted to say this at the very beginning but it's important to be stated i'm i've been more excited about this conversation than a lot of conversations that i've had on podcasts because you're doing something that's very different from other individuals. You're having a very deep conversation that involves being transparent and dropping the shield, right? Where a lot of other conversations are, you know, let's talk about the excitement of marketing, branding, personal development, all the easy things to talk about that I can talk about from a surface level, from a perspective where I read a book and I'm sharing some stories I read in a book. But in this conversation, the only way for us to really share the true value is to share our personal stories and our yeah. darkest moments. And, you know, today is my birthday. I could have spent time anywhere. I could have gone to any party this morning. <laughs> but I said, I want to have a conversation with Mike. And I've been more excited to do this than anything else that's coming up today because this is where I can honestly say I'm not very experienced about. I get a little nervous sometimes yeah. because I'm sensitive about how other people are receiving this message because right. I don't talk about this enough. So I'm, I'm coming in with the environment of saying I'm not an expert in the subject, but I have a story that I believe relates to this, this aspect. And I can share my story as openly as I want. People will perceive it in different ways, but the story really comes down to being in a situation very similar to yours, being in a situation where 
everything is going wrong. You know, I was I was putting on thirty thousand dollars in debt. I gained a lot of weight. I was um, I was kicked out of university because my grades were low. I had debts happening in the family. I had a, a girlfriend that I thought I'd be married with today that we broke apart and we went different ways. There was just so many things that were happening in my life that made me made it very difficult to be optimistic. Right, made it very difficult to um, believe that there is some good out in the world and that the world is against you, which mm-hmm, I think is something mm-hmm. that I thought a lot about back then. And my personality type, although it's very hard to believe now, is <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a super shy introvert. And I remember sitting in university just before I got kicked out for, for uh, academic probation. I remember being in depression in the full extreme. I remember sitting in class and I remember looking around the room and – saying, I just wish someone would lend me a helping hand. I just wish someone would say, you're not looking right. Something seems off about you. Do you need a hand? And I never got that help. And I was too shy to speak up, so I really never got that help. And I came to a position where I didn't think anyone similar to you was able to relate to my problem so they wouldn't understand it, and I thought I was in it alone. And through my personal development and growth along the way, I was very amazed by how many resources are actually available. It just took some time for me to go out and find it. More importantly, it took time for me to drop the ego of saying that I can deal with this myself Mm -hmm. and actually going out and reaching to other individuals. So when you and I get on stage, just like we did at that event last year, I look around the room and I look around for people that I say, I know they're not going to tell me that something's wrong because we don't know each other that way. But I just want to share something that hopefully they can benefit from, even if they never tell me down the road that it saved their life or it helped them. Once in a while, I get a message. Someone says, I heard you speak three years ago, and it changed my life. Thank you so much. And that means the world to me. Like That's Mm -hmm. why I do it. But some people don't, and 99% won't, and I'm okay with that. I just want people to get the better out of it and encourage them that there are resources out there that they could reach out to. Yeah, that's that's really nice. When right towards the end, this – and a reflection popped into my head about it comes from I hesitate to say Buddhist teachers, yes, but sort of mindfulness slash Buddhist teachers, the idea of just planting seeds in people's minds or hearts or whatever and when when the kids or anyone listening um, once it gets in there somewhere in their heart or mind, it's there, and whenever you know the universe or whatever it is works in its own way. And that seed might get fertile fertilized or Mm -hmm. start growing at any given time. And you never know. Um, but it, you can, I don't know if it's some human thing or whatnot, but you can't help when someone's speaking to you honestly about something, you can't help, but listen, it's almost ingrained in us to listen to each other because we, I'm sure that's part of evolution and how we've managed to survive and sort of dominate the animal kingdom. But anyway, it it is so true. And you never know when that person's going to say, oh, I remember you said this at this time and whatever. And that happens to me often. I'm like, oh, oh I bet. Yeah. You, that you, you really dive in and, deep. Yeah. And I, I've always been so fascinated and amazed whenever somebody is – speaking honestly about something sincere i just am so drawn to it because it's actually a huge part of what saved me slash allowed me to heal was just hearing other people's stories and some oh so interesting yeah Yeah. and what's unique i guess or fortunate for people it's so funny fortunate for people that have substance abuse issues is these 12-step communities in the city um they're free they're you know people get turned off for various reasons, which I can understand. But if you are able to look past the things that keep you from returning, it's just a group of people that meet frequently and just share the deepest, darkest things that they could possibly imagine. And how it's powerful unbe- is that? It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It's how, how powerful is that? Yeah. You're, you're meeting people for maybe the first or yeah. second time yeah. and you're pouring your heart out. Yeah. Yeah. It's right? like, so weird, yeah. but amazing. Yeah. I've, um, <laughs> you know, I, last year I had the opportunity to speak at Scouts Canada for their once a year event. And it was a really amazing. special event for me, um, where they brought in the boy and girl Scouts of Canada to come in together with their grandparents and their parents. Wow. Um, what was really interesting to me that, uh, that, 
kind of connects to what you're talking about was as I was walking into the event and as the event planner was kind of guiding me through the room, people were coming up to me and they were shaking their, my hand, but they were shaking my hand with their left hand. And it was a little odd to me because if you think about it, a world where everyone's shaking hands with the left hand, it kind of throws you off from yeah. your routine. <laughs> now, when the first one did it, I was... I just thought, hey, he's probably left-handed. Uh -huh. I'm not going to think about it. Uh -huh. It's okay. When the second and third person did it, I thought the whole universe was playing a sick practical joke on me. <laughs> like this, It was like everyone was in on it except me, and I yeah. hate them for it. <laughs> and then when the fourth one did it, I snapped. I started saying, guys, what's going on? Like, Have I been doing handshakes wrong all my life? Like, uh -huh. I started questioning my own sanity. <laughs> but then, then they opened up to me, and they shared a very interesting story about – um, the story of the Shanti warriors. Now, it's a great story. There's a lot to learn about it, but I'm going to give you the short version of it. But I encourage anyone listening to actually dive in deeper because there's so much more to the story. But the story about the Shanti warriors was when the Shanti chiefs would meet with visitors that come on their land, they would walk up with their sword and their shield, but they would shake with their left hand because when you shake with your right hand, it involves you putting down your sword but keeping up your shield. So you're saying, I'm not going to strike you, but you're, I'm, I also don't trust you enough to drop my shield, so I'm going to keep my shield up and protect myself. Where when they're shaking with their left hand, they're dropping their shield and they're saying, I give you full control to strike, you, strike me if you might, but I'm opening up, I'm dropping my shield. And I always loved that story and it forever stuck with me since because I always think about the perspective of that's how human connections should be. Like if you truly want to connect with other individuals, be it on a personal basis, be it on a marketing basis, whatever you want to call it, but creating a human connection at the end of the day, it involves you actually coming up with saying, I'm dropping my shield. Mm -hmm. Not that you need to shake with your left hand because sure. that requires more explaining than you might want to do, <laughs> but dropping your shield and saying, I'm opening up. Let's just open up, drop our shields, and have a full conversation, trusting that we're not going to hurt each other, so we're okay mm -hmm. with it. Um, it opens up a completely different perspective in each other's eyes where they're now bonding in a level where they completely trust each other. So they feel easy. They feel it easy to be transparent and honest, and they share their deepest, darkest secrets. And as, as a result of that, they have the opportunity to help each other get out of it. Yeah, wow. That's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, it's – uh, who would have thought? Scouts yeah, Canada, yeah, I went no there kidding. to teach them, and I left with the, I was the one that left with the lesson. <laughs> wow. So here's – talking about being honest. so funny. I remember you saying March 5th is my birthday. And one thing I'm trying to get better at is remembering little things like that. And then, you know, I'm like, oh, I should have brought him a card or something <laughs> like – you know what I mean? Like those are the little things that – Although they're not necessary, they're like I, I little things where oh, I'm like, damn it. I knew it was your birthday. You told me it was. And I didn't wish no, you happy no birthday. No, no worries, so man. Hey, yeah. the, the gift is being able to come up here and <laughs> yeah. jam with you, my friend. Still, yeah. But okay. So um, you did. We went on a, on a sidetrack there. You asked me what the point was. The turning point. Yeah, yes. Because I want to get into your – because you shared a little bit of it at the school and it was fascinating and – such an amazing contrast to the kids growing up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, okay, so uh, right, I'll just say this quickly and then let's get into that. Sure. Um, what happened? I basically, I got married. So I thought that was going to save me basically. Um, and I became a professional poker player. And so I had all these things on the outside that I was trying to keep up the shield, you know? It's almost like interesting. Yeah. The, the weaker... I became or the more sick I became, the bigger I had to make the shield, you know, kind of thing to keep up the I get internal it. lies intense. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so after getting married and the we bought a house and my wife started a business, the caves just or the walls were crashing down and who knows what. It's so hard to describe that turning point, but whatever it was, I had had some dark moments and some pretty – not nice ways of thinking. Uh, and those started to scare me enough. And then I just asked for help. And I have an army of people that have helped me get here, you know, doctors, therapists, uh, peer support groups, like the whole nine mm. yards. And so that to this day is what has kept me and got me well. And now sort of there's this beautiful, it's sort of a spiritual saying, but you can't keep what you don't freely give away. And wow. that, that always really stuck with me too. And so, Love that. yeah, it's really lovely. Um, and so as much as I can, I 
do for others and sometimes to a fault. Um, so that's something maybe I'm working on. <laughs> it's like, where's that boundary of like, okay, enough is enough. And mm. I got to just worry about myself. Um, but that's sort of what happened. Yeah. So and ask, what's asking for help was a, was a big step for you. Absolutely. The and, biggest. and you, and you got it. I got that, it. That was what yeah. was interesting. Yeah. And I, cause I called a friend of mine who I used to rave with, <laughs> uh, and I just thought, you know, if that guy can do it, yeah. I have a chance. Um, and he, I remember sort of melting in a sense in his arms when he's like, you don't have to do this anymore. I started crying and that was like the moment of liberation for me. And yeah, and I had some not so helpful people along the way. And the key is just sort of learning to not get caught up in trying to control those who aren't helping you or something yes. like that. I, at the, I went to this addiction, I don't know, it's like an, a recovery program at a hospital and when i said told them i was a professional poker player they were just like addict <laughs> right it's like you can't do that yeah. like, you're an addict what's wrong with you and i for a little while i got cut up in trying to convince them that poker was the actually the only good thing in my life it was like your outlet yeah it yeah. was the only thing that that i could i mean i guess other than being married but I could sort of think to myself, I'm not such a pathetic human being. At mm. least I'm really good at this. Right. And it showed me that if I worked hard at something, I could accomplish something. Anyway, so I was just getting caught That's up so along the though. way, getting mm. caught up with trying to convince other people that your way is right, right or that you're not what they think you are. And just right. That's really. Yeah recipe for disaster and so i mean similar yeah. similar quote to yours i also believe that it's very difficult to help someone that doesn't want to be helped yeah it's impossible and, right actually, they're yeah. they're they're putting up the shield and it's as much as you try hammering away from it you're just pushing them away further yeah. and you know you're born in a certain family you, it's it's difficult to move away from your family if they're the ones that are hurting you but it's possible but the ones that i don't give a lot of clout towards is when people say they have a hard time because their friends are bringing them down. Number one, if they're bringing you down, they're not your freaking friends, <laughs> right? Like, let's reevaluate who your friends are. Right. But I have no problem cutting ties and, like, breaking bridges apart if it means that I'm distancing myself from people that are meaning me more harm. And harm could, can be physical. It could. Yeah. But it's more often than not, it's more emotional and mental, right? Mm -hmm. They're involved in environments where they're putting you down. They're telling you what you're doing is not working. They're making you feel ashamed of your lifestyle. And I've had no problem over the years actually separating myself away in the process of working on myself. So I do encourage individuals that if you're in an environment where you're not getting help or you're getting put down and actually going down the other spectrum where they're pushing you away from pr progression and growing up, it's very important just as much as working on yourself to actually eliminate the people that are holding you back. So that's been a big part of it. So I love that you looked out for help. I'm really happy that you found it. And I think that's reassurance that they're out there all the time. Mm -hmm. Your community, mm -hmm. with you, it starts with me. You're out there all the time. I always see you at events. I always see you uh, posting on social media with messages that you shared at an event that you're bringing into the network. So I love that you do that. Um, social media is another part of the conversation where there's a big discussion about how it's affecting mental health. And there's a lot of different people that you could find in your social media environment. They could be people that are sharing positive messages and are uplifting like your account, right? Whenever I read a quote from your account, it's very motivating to me. It's a good way to start the day. So I actually enjoy looking at it. But there's also a lot of people that are posting negative BS, and I'm very quick to unfollow them. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking more about the unfollow button, and I said to myself, how quiet would the world be if you unfollowed every single person? And then you opened up your Instagram account and you saw nothing on the feed. It's very peaceful. In fact, mm. it's a nice feeling. <laughs> and I realized that you actually had the opportunity to control the noise on your social media. And there's people that says, I need to delete my account because it's getting too noisy. Yeah. I actually encourage them to go through a digital cleanse and actually audit who they're following. I do it once a quarter. Every three months, I stop what I'm doing. I spend one evening going through my list, and I unfollow a lot of people that I don't really keep up with or don't add value to my life. And it starts shrinking over time. So 
you know, when you think about celebrities that just follow their wives or their husbands, and every time they open it, they see someone they love. Right. Why can't we all do that? Why can't we all just create an environment where the only thing we're seeing in our feed is similar to going through our family fo- uh, photo album and looking at people that we love? And I think that is a big influence towards helping people manage social media a bit better. Yeah, that's really insightful. Um, wow. I don't know how to respond to that because that's really helpful, actually. And anyway, I'm going to put that aside and maybe come back to that if something. But that's really helpful for anyone out there listening. Yeah, yeah. big time. It's yeah. it's a big discussion. Um, yeah. I was speaking to an individual the other day, and he said, I truly think that there's going to be clinics that are specifically specialized in um, social media assistance, like mental health, yeah. helping people yeah. with it. Yeah. And I believe it. I, do I believe too. we'll get to that point. In the meantime, um, as you're trying to go out there and escaping from that environment, there's a lot of opportunities to actually have an enjoyable experience. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people will send me a message back when I posted about it because, you know, no one likes talking about the unfollow button out of the fear that they're going to get unfollowed. <laughs> so I posted out there being like completely transparent. Yeah. And people will message me once in a while saying, hey, message received, unfollowing you, thank you. And I said, awesome. Yeah, I'm actually very happy yeah, that yeah. you have unfollowed me as a result of making your experience better. I try to put out positive vibes out there all the time time but i also know i post every day and i also know that may be overwhelming on someone's cell phone device so i say whatever makes your online experience more pleasant do it like be selfish in this it's about you and your mental health to be very self selfish with that decision that's amazing um i think you know what i think there might already be some specific well there certainly is sort of internet addiction therapies or whatever Mm -hmm. it's really what does the problem look like in the person's life and if it is cell phone i know the dad of this uh, of a kid at my son's school did a a show for amazon tv or whatever about six teens or something that went on a digital detox to some treatment thing and i haven't watched it because you can't watch it in canada uh so to speak to that yeah it's probably already it's happening elsewhere. It's going to roll yeah. its way down here so- sooner or later. Yeah, and there's a lot of evidence how unhealthy social media is becoming for young kids, it's particularly uh, tween girls. It's it's really having an impact, although there's not enough evidence out there too. Yeah, but, it's it's a scary adjustment for a human being. I mean, the average person on social media, you know, let's use Instagram as an example, is following two thousand people. And imagine an environment where you're in a room with 2,000 people and they're all talking at the same time. It's a scary thought, <laughs> no man. No kidding. It's freaky. Yeah. And that's oh. actually what's happening on your cell phone device. Every right. time you open right. the phone, it's like 2,000 people are just yelling in the same environment and sharing their story and what yeah. they want to do. So right. it's overwhelming. It's a human beings were not born or engineered to be able to receive that, yes. that much information at the same time. It's a blessing in disguise as well, right? Because you have resources at your fingertips whenever you need it. Right. But at the same time, you need to be able to control, like a radio dial, I think you need to control the volume and decide how much you want to take in and how much you don't until you find a level that works well with your personality type. Some people need a lot of alone time. Mm-hmm. I'm a heavy introvert. I need a lot of alone time. So I get off social media a lot. It seems like I'm very active, but the reality is I'm going on and posting once a day and spending the rest of my time sending messages. I, and then I get offline. I don't spend a lot of time on the feed. Some people are extroverts and they want to be part of that conversation because those are energy boosters for them. And I encourage that as well. So figure out what works for you. The great thing about radio dials is everyone can have their own volume and you can change it as you wish. That's super duper uh, helpful and insightful. I don't... You got to start your own uh, social media <laughs> philosophy uh, radio show. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. no, that's really helpful because you don't actually hear people talking about it in thorough and deeper ways. Um, but that's really insightful. And what comes up for me sometimes is thinking, at least this is for me, this weird parallel between it's almost a form of people pleasing or oh, if I don't follow this person or if I do and and, uh, I'm going to unfollow them, what are they going to think? And I know that's going on in a lot of people's heads and whatever, Um, but it doesn't matter. And sort of what you're saying is so true and helpful and I'm going to let that sink in for myself and see how that plays out. It's worth thinking about. And I also encourage the using social media as an opportunity to actually meet individuals in person. Having a good right. balance between right. the two of 
not only doing online conversation, but actually nurturing that relationship with them in person. So I met more individuals last year than I've ever had on any single year. And it was all through social media. I would connect with people and we would send each other messages and we would meet up in person. You and I actually did that, right? We had mm -hmm. a cup of coffee. And that feels good because yeah, that allows yeah. you to disconnect and have a human conversation yeah. with one individual. Yeah. You're now super focused on talking and learning about one person as if you were just hanging out with your friends at, at the, on the living room, right? Like it's not, it doesn't feel overwhelming. You're in a relaxed environment. You're in your own world and you've put the phone away. Yeah. So having a good mix of trying to actually meet the individuals in person and not only online, can, actually allows you to have a very healthy relationship. And I would even argue that it increases human connections more than the people that are saying that when you're looking at your cell phone, you're actually like you're destroying those relationships and you're moving further away from it. I speak the other way. I said, if you're, if you're acting on it and you're building right. authentic relationships, you're actually using social media the right way. Yes. And that's where I think the big boundary is or the con the key is using it as a tool for human connection yes as opposed to artificial human connection we forget of, the social part of social media yeah. <laughs> right and it's like you gotta socialize man yeah like, right yeah <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to move away from it you can it's fun and it's fun and even for myself being a shy introvert yeah it's fun for me and i didn't think it would be i mean i met over 100 people last year just through social media and when i met them in person i would get a bit of anxiety at first because yeah. it's the fear of saying man i'm meeting someone new this yeah. may be weird but every single time i leave a better person yeah. i get inspired by them i get in a great mood out, coming out of a really fun conversation and to me it empowers me more to actually get out of my shell and meet more people yeah that's freaking awesome thank you <laughs> yeah it, yeah that was really helpful was for me because this is one of those things that i don't i haven't wrapped my head around yet and then uh, you can already see why it's difficult to do this in a public stage, right? Yeah, it's yeah, like we just yeah. dove into like five different things. How yeah. do you do that when you have to have a focused topic in, yeah. a, in a stage environment? Right, right. Um, I'm curious though because I saw you do uh, a very short talk, and it was more about your story. But when you go out there with starts with me, yeah. and your team goes out there, you talked about how your turning point was asking for help, and that made a difference. What is it that when you get on stage and you're hoping that there's this one message that you nail home that the students leave with, is it about asking for help or is there something more to it in your talks? Yeah, I don't know. To be honest, I think part of it is my main goal is speaking as honestly and sincerely as I possibly can. And so I'm just trying to role model, I guess, or model the behavior of being honest about what's going on inside my head. And that I think is the biggest thing I can give people. Um, and that's the biggest thing I've learned from these 12 step meetings and et cetera, and just practicing in these sort of mindful communities and stuff, communicating a sincere and honest description of my perception of reality in a sense, because everyone is just bullshitting each other I all the it. time. It's yeah. just nonstop. And so that's the number one thing is just ref giving people an example of what it looks like to describe one's emotions and thoughts and it's, et cetera, in a way that's responsible and clear, you know, as clear as it can be sometimes. And then I think when I have longer periods, I was just do I did a three hour workshop the other day with a pretty good client. Uh, it's an amazing story. Long story short, uh, management across this big industry uh, all across a bunch of different owners and corporations were trying to solve the sort of mental health problems within their workforce and nothing they were doing was working. So mm -hmm. they commissioned this big study and what they found out was that had they just asked the employees what was wrong, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and had a sincere conversation they would have found yes. the answer, so to speak. And so they basically, everything they were doing was backwards. And once they did the research and asked people what the hell was going on, they found out what was going mm. on. And okay. now they're sitting here being, which is why they hired me for the most part, because um, I'd done some work with them before, prior to the study coming out. And it was just so interesting to sort of, how do you help people have open, sincere conversations without sort of thinking you know what's right. I mean, you may have an idea of what's right, which is cool, but you have to engage in dialogue with people. Um, and so in that workshop, a lot of it was 
I would, I, every time I'm trying to talk about something or communicate something, I always bring it back to what does this look like in my life? in this moment or in an interaction with my kid or my wife or my friends or whoever. And that gives people the, the abstract idea, the real life example. And it sort of just seems to hit them so That's much so stronger. Great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And these guys were <laughs> disclosing maybe is not the right word, but really intimate details about their lives in an environment where you would not think that mm -hmm. that was going to come out at all. Uh, it was so beautiful. And and that's sort of what always reminds me that what I'm doing is on the right path. Yeah. Whether I can improve it, no doubt, and I can get better at it and more concise and et cetera. But, that's great, man. You, know, you yeah. guys were just a bunch of Ashanti warriors dropping yeah. their, <laughs> yeah, dropping yeah, their yeah. shields, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, like, no it, doubt. it was yeah. a bunch of people in the room that were like, yeah. I feel – it's a very interesting point when someone gets to an environment where they're openly sharing their life story with you. Like you've got them to a level where they're at that comfort. Um, it's a challenging thing for us. You know, we want to help so many people. We want to say that, hey, we've been there and we want to get you out of there. It's challenging. And sometimes I think it just involves learning a bit more about them. From my side, um, yeah, you know, no, no, one so of – well, Okay, sorry. Go on. Yeah. I want to ask you – you got to give us some of your history. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. So so I shared a little bit about my yeah. university state where everything was going wrong and I was about to get kicked out, and, and that sucked. Yeah. But one of the things that I asked you when you get up on stage, what's that point that you want to hit home? Yeah. One of the things I always want to hit home is the idea of remembering your burning desire and why you're doing it. And this ties back with my childhood story where I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I was do you born have there. I do. I have yeah. three brothers. Yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah. I'm the, where are you in the I, I'm number three. Okay. So I've I've had the fair share of suffering the as a kid in the middle. Yeah. You know, I get <laughs> I get um, handovers, like I don't get new toys, I don't yeah, get new yeah. clothes. But at the same time I also don't get treated like the young kid. Yeah. So it's uh <laughs> there's there's some good in all that. Okay, cool. Are they all in Toronto? Um, they're close by. They're yeah. in the vicinity of the okay. GTA area, so cool. some one of them is uh, a little further out. But yeah. yeah, we're we're very close. My parents are in Mississauga, so I see them all on a regular basis. Nice. We've yeah. always stayed tight knit. Now, what was interesting? Okay, so yeah, so you grew up in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, in yeah. Saudi Arabia, it was interesting. I was I was so young, so you'd almost think I'd forget these memories, but it was yeah. so vivid that it stuck with me. My parents, same situation as we are right now, where they were surrounded by their family, they were surrounded by their friends. And they grew up in an environment where they thought they would spend their entire life there. Never did they suspect that they would be moving away to the other side of the world and yeah. starting a life here. And it all really came down to a political era that was very difficult around the idea of them having a civil war to settle a very difficult time that was happening. And during the time of the civil war, what would happen is – while we were staying in our apartment building, we would hear a siren that plays across from our building. And that siren was there to indicate that there was some kind of a tank or a firearm that's going by our building. And they're warning us to take cover because shots may be getting like fired outside. So my dad would very quickly, as the protector of the family, he would put a plastic sheet above our heads. He would put gas masks around our necks. And he would do that just in case... Things were shot down and there was dust and there was debris falling and we would be protected. So he was taking precautionary steps. And then the siren would finally shut off the next day. We would go outside, you know, after suffering through all that in complete fear inside of the building, we would go outside and we would look over and our neighbor's building was shot down. Like someone shot um, probably through their tanks and fired it at the building's direction and shot the building down. And... It made me think about the crisis that was happening in that environment, how many people died, how many people suffered, and also the fact that it could have been us, yeah. right? If, there, if the tank was shooting even 45 degrees to the right, it would have been our building that was shot down, and it could have been us that were dead. So my parents making a very wise decision, although it was tough for them, they moved away from their entire family and friends. They basically packed up, left everything behind to bring us over here. And did you come start directly, a fresh life? Did you come directly to Toronto or no? Uh, well, we lived in Mississauga first. Oh, sorry, right. Um, yeah. And we also lived in Toronto for a short period of time. But Mississauga was always home to me. Right. So yeah. Um, so you came straight to yeah. Canada, basically. Yeah. Exactly. And what was that like? Culture shock, man. It, it was weird. Like, oh, there's there's man. funny stories that I even think about where I was in grade four. I remember yeah. my first time that I was here and. You know, back in the Saudi Arabia, when you were in school, mm -hmm. when the teacher would ask you a question, you would stand up. Okay. And you would answer them by saying the answer followed by their last name. So it would be like, 
hey, what's four plus four? Yeah. You put up your hand, you'd say the, the and you'd stand up and you say the answer is eight, Mrs. Robinson. Right. And then you sit back down. Yeah. And I did that on my first day yeah. <laughs> in, in grade Wait, did four. Did you here. learn English in Saudi Arabia? I did. I, yeah. So I did was. Did you go to an international school? I did or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had a uh, Sri Lankan international school, I believe yeah. it was called, um, that did a great job in helping individuals with math as well as English. I yeah. think those were the top two. So when I came here, I was pretty good wow. at both. Yeah. And although my English was pretty good, I was still um, suffering from the social interactions, yeah. right? Because at first, it was already weird that I stood up and I said the answer and <laughs> yes. and and everyone was like, what the heck is this guy doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, now given props to the teacher because the teacher was like pointing at me as like the role model. Yeah, like, this no is kidding. who you should be yes, like. This yes, is respectful. Yes, so yes. good on the teacher with how they handled it. But yeah. I always remember I was very, very quickly treated like the outlier you know i was mm-hmm. like i was so different from everybody i wouldn't play with them I, I i was very shy and awkward and it was tough for me where now that i've grown up and i've lived in this country since 1994 i'm in this environment now where i look for those people and i i say i get where you're at yeah and i want to be your friend like i want to help you get out of it if you're not feeling well and you're not happy with where you are. And I'm the kind of guy now when I go to parties, like if I see that one person that's quiet and not having a good time, yeah. I feel the need to go up to them and strike a conversation. Like I've I've become like the protector of them, yeah, yeah. which is ironic because the name of foos <laughs> means like protector or safe, like to be safe. No so it's, um, it's interesting. My parents called me that and I always think that's about lovely. that being a role for me. But yeah. the important thing is my parents sacrificed everything and brought me here. Yeah. They gave me a chance to start a fresh life. I could have been dead and I could have started a life that I wasn't happy with down there in a very difficult time. Yeah. Yet here I was in a country that was very free, gave me an opportunity to start fresh and build a life of my own. And I was so disappointed at who I was becoming by all these downfalls that were happening, getting kicked out of university, picking up debt, um, not being able to show my parents that it was worth it. So then I started having this burning desire saying, I need to give back to my parents because nothing I do in this world will be good enough to justify what they did for me, right? Nothing I do, and no matter how good I'm doing now or how good I do in the future, I always think my parents always have done more for me or else I wouldn't have even had this opportunity. So keeping that in the back of my mind now fuels me to get back to the areas where I can do some good and I could help other individuals because I was given that help back then as well. Yeah, wow. What And um, I was just thinking uh, your your parents. So it does take a... unique set of individuals to do what they did um and yeah they must have i mean all of your family has obviously seen and been through a lot how i guess you sort of spoke about how that influenced where you are now and stuff um how did they i guess help you and your brother's transition um did you see it being hard for them at times and what might some of those things be and then also on top of that what did you study in university and then yeah that sort of for sure yeah i mean i think it was harder for them than it was for me right i was young i was still trying to figure out my place in society my parents were much older they were nurtured they have picked up um, a lifestyle around Saudi Arabia all yeah. their life. Yeah. So now imagine after, you know, I think they were in their 40s when they decided, oh, maybe I need to change my lifestyle completely. That's yeah. a scary thought. Yeah, no you kidding. know, I'm 33 yeah. today and yeah. I think it's scary to think I have to start living in a completely different way than I was it's back then. Yeah. So it, it was much harder for them. I think my parents had a lot a lot more of a difficult time. Uh, my dad graduated at a university in Saudi Arabia in economics and yeah. that really didn't matter here. Right, because yeah. they needed you to go to that education system here. So my dad was doing flooring at Home Depot. Yeah, my mom, who didn't really had to work um, for money back then in Saudi Arabia, she was now doing housekeeping in a hotel. And I could tell that it really bothered them to make that transition where they were doing well and now they're not. And it was very heartbreaking for me to see. And we also didn't come with a lot of money, mm-hmm. so my dad um, helped me grow with the mentality, which it wasn't really a great mentality after I've started breaking out of it, but the mentality of playing it safe, right? Just keep your head down, work hard, don't ask questions, don't argue, just do what they tell you to do and bring home some money and just make the bare minimum. It wasn't about being optimistic about opportunities and acting on it and making things happen out of your life. It's just go with the format. And it was a very old-fashioned way of thinking. I understood that. Mm -hmm. I didn't back then. 
So I was treating myself in a way where I would play it safe. I would always try to get jobs that I know would give me my 40 hours a week, even if it was minimum wage. I don't care how crappy it was. My dad always taught me not to complain. And I love that. Yeah. I love the don't yeah. complain. Yeah. So even though now I've, I've trained myself and engineered myself to break out of that shell and start actually approaching the world in ways that are a bit more creative than mm-hmm. the safety net that my dad used to put up, mm-hmm. I still have the no complain rule. No matter how bad things get, I don't complain because I always know that someone in Saudi Arabia is still having it worse. Right? Someone in different countries are having it much worse than I am, and who am I to complain about how bad life is? And I give myself the opportunity to say I know things aren't okay. And I remember a saying that the school that we spoke at last year, the year before, they're saying on the back of the shirt said it's okay not to be okay. And I love that because it's true. You don't have to beat yourself up saying, why are other people happy and I'm not? I'm a terrible human being because of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a point where there's days where if things aren't going well, I say it's okay not to be okay. But I also don't complain. I say, how do I get out of it? That's the yeah, that's, that's a big part really of it. Part of it yeah. And that, I think that second half is yeah. the mindset that a lot yeah. of people have struggled to adapt. Yeah. And I think it takes time. It's definitely easier said than done. But the greatest feeling in the world when you finally adapt that to your lifestyle is you never go back. Yeah. Once you see the benefits of thinking that way, mm-hmm. of saying I'm going to do something about it and making the decision to reinvent myself, which is where the idea of Project Reinvention, my initiative, came to life, that's when I said – it got life got so good that if I knew it got this good, I would have done it twice as fast. You know, like I would have worked twice as hard to get yeah. out of that environment <laughs> that I used to be in. So now I talk about that on stage, hoping someone else has that mentality of saying, "I know things are bad. Yeah. It's okay that it's bad. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to do something about it." Yeah, that's awesome. And that's a nice segue too. Actually, can you tell us a bit about? Um, oh, I was curious what you studied in university, but then can you also, I guess, tell us? A bit of that story and then how Project Reinvention came about and what it was like to write a book and then to yeah. do all the things you're doing with it. It's super cool. It's, it's The last two years have been crazy. I actually – like my 30s have just started and I'm honestly <laughs> enjoying the 30s more than I have all of my 20s. Is that weird? Like a lot of people think know, 20s yeah. are the prime years, yeah, man, yeah, but I'm know. loving 30s right yeah. now. And um, <laughs> so, so what I was doing in university was – playing the safety game as my dad has taught right, me, which right. I was taking business administration mm-hmm. because it was easy to get into and I didn't want to be left behind while my friends were kind of moving ahead out of high school. Hold on, was it easy because you were good at math and you were a good student or just... I'm, I'm terrible at math and okay. I'm a terrible student. Okay. It's just easy to get into based on grade standards. So like I had okay. like a C student it's borderline almost in. Wow. You okay, know? Cool. So, yeah, yeah. So okay. it, it wasn't hard to get I've, in. Had I known it was that easy, I might have tried to get into <laughs> that instead. Okay, That's right. Sorry. Yeah. So, so I got into University of Toronto. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with my friends that I went to high school with. Yeah. And then I told you I went through a depression time yeah. where things were going wrong, but I couldn't ask for help. And um, I got kicked out because I wasn't doing great at school as a result of battling with depression. I got kicked out. I took a year off. And at that time, I just kind of took a year off to get my stuff together. I was mentally grooming myself to come back stronger. So I decided to go back into Sheridan College. Now, while I was in university, although everything went wrong and I got slapped in the face in every way, I've also had a blessing where I got to sit in on a marketing class. And the marketing class was extravagant, if for anything, for the great teacher that was in front Mm -hmm. of the room. And I admire great teachers so much yeah. because of it because he came up and it was him in front of a room of 500 students, which is overwhelming to teach because you got to maintain a lot of, um, lot of attention. But what, what was interesting is he would teach a class at 9 a.m. on Monday yeah. and you would never find an empty seat. Wow. Like everyone showed up to his class That's because awesome, he was yeah. so great at storytelling where it wasn't as much about what was in that textbook. It was more about – as a full-time marketer that he does outside of school, yeah. he comes back and shares his personal story. Yeah. So literally, he would come to Monday to teach, but at Sunday, he was in Japan running a business meeting. Like, it's insane how yeah. how yeah. active his lifestyle <laughs> was. And he did this silly project, but the silly project changed my life, man. He basically made us break out into quarters. So out of the 500 people, we all broke out into our different groups. And he basically made us run a fake, like a fictional shoe company. 
And he said, I want you to think about what do you want to call the shoe company? I want you to think about how it would look, who your target market is, how you can creatively bring it out to market, what's your marketing strategy. And that was just such a fun project. Mm. At that point, my creative juices were flowing where at the end of that exercise, I said, I enjoyed the crap out of that. If that's marketing and you get paid to do that, I want to do that for a living. (laughs) So I looked more into it. And although by then it was too late and I got kicked out of university, when I went back to college where I enrolled into Sheridan College, I remembered that exercise and I said, I actually want to give marketing a try. And imagine my surprise where it was just everything I wanted marketing to be. The idea of coming up with ideas and bringing it to life, getting creative every single day, helping clients solve business problems. I instantly fell in love with it. So I joined a company called Candy Box Marketing and that was became my big passion. Now, while I was also in school, back at Sheridan College, I always hated the fact that I never got a helping hand while I was in depression. And it was something that always stayed in the back of my mind that I wanted to do something about. So as I started getting my life back together in college and really just kicking butt because I was so motivated to give back to my parents and come back strong after everything Mm -hmm. I went through in university, I said, now that I'm in a good place, I'm going to start my own initiative while I'm in college. I called it Project Reinvention, and the whole idea was to bring students together in a room and share my stories with them. Share what I went through and that fact that you can actually get out of it because I was a case study that's possible. And I also started a website, and I started writing blog articles. I didn't think of it as a marketing site. I didn't know marketing. I didn't think of it as getting sales. I just saw it as a platform to share my story in written word. So here I am writing blog articles, and it was crazy. With Did you just write about like any whatever was going on and just things that were going on and things I believed in? Okay, right, cool. believing yeah. in the burning desire, believing in positive attitude, believing in circle of friends matter, and all these personal things that I believed yeah. in. And the ironic part was. It was also the moment I realized how big the internet opportunity was. I had a moment in my life where um, I was giving a campus tour while working at Sheridan College and going to school at the same time. And I had a moment during the tour where my eyes were just burning. I was getting an itch and I didn't know what it was only to realize later that I was getting an eye infection. And it was burning with in the middle of me giving a (laughs) tour to 40 people wondering, is this guy stoned because his eyes are bloodshot red? And... (laughs) I was at a point where I was scratching it to a point where I had to excuse myself on the tour and I ran to the medical clinic in in that campus and I begged them to save me because I thought I was losing my eyesight. I lost my eyesight for two days because I couldn't open my eyelids based on that infection. And after I recovered and I was in day three where I was slightly getting my eyesight back, I pulled up my laptop laying in my bed and I typed an article called The Day I Went Blind and I put it up on my website, not thinking anything of it. The next week following that, I started getting so much traffic on that website. Now, given, now that I think back to it, The Day I Went Blind is a super clickbait title, right? Whatever. It it got a lot of attention, but (laughs) people were reading it. And the article talked about two things. Number one, with how much your the human's mentality changes when you lose your eyesight. Your human mentality automatically adapts to an environment. So you start, your mind automatically says, hey, there's exactly 16 steps on the stairs. You turn left in exactly four steps because you don't want to hit a wall. So your mind finds a way to make work itself out, which that analogy is used to think about environments where you feel like you're lacking control. And your mind will find solutions and think mm-hmm. of ways to get you out of there. Number two, I talked about gratitude, how when I couldn't see and I couldn't do anything, my parents were helping me get to my room. They were actually making me food and feeding me. They're, my My girlfriend was helping me get on a transit bus because I couldn't drive. And there was just so many things that were um, – truly allowing the people around me to show me their true colors, which they were helpful and they really cared for me. So gratitude is something I talked about. A week later, I got contacted by a professor that goes to a university in Iran, and he teaches there to a class of 500 students. And he asked me permission to share my blog story with that room Crazy. in the other side of the world. Yeah, and, and here I'm thinking, <laughs> like, he sent me an email, yeah. and I opened up that email, and it had an attachment of a photograph of him speaking in front of class with my face on the projector with the title, The Day I Went Blind. And I'm like, I was in my bed, in my PJs, with half eyes open, typing out an article, and now it's being read and and shared with students, university students on the other side of the world. How freaking awesome is this opportunity? 
And at that point, I realized that I wanted to share my story in a bigger scale where it wasn't just shared in college. I wanted to get it out to the world in a bigger um, bigger atmosphere mm-hmm. of actually sharing things through digital. So I got involved with social media and website, and I got really good at it over the years. But it came down to the prime thesis of just wanting to help people reinvent themselves. All I wanted to do was share my story. I didn't want to sell a product. So when I released my book a year ago, it was the same idea of saying the book is just another way for me to share my story in a bigger way. It's easier to share a full story in a book than it is on a one-hour talk on yeah, stage. Yeah. So now when I speak at events, more often than not, I actually just give my books away. Right? The event will pay me to come and speak, and I say, hey, if you don't mind, I'd like to give everyone a free copy of my book and sign it because I want them to have that story as something to take home rather than just the message that I'm sharing on stage. Beautiful. That's nice. Can you tell us a little bit? So is the book basically is the story of this whole process? Is that yeah, sort of what's in the it, book? So, so it's called Project Reinvention, and the subtitle is the, sh- the Social Timeline of a Millennial. And the idea of that is giving me the opportunity to share my story in a very structured format from beginning to end. And what, what the reason I called it the Social Timeline is I got to do something really fun with this book that I get a lot of props for. Like people say, I've read books and I've never seen something like this, which is I took apart my social media timeline on Facebook. I basically went through Facebook. I went back 10 years in time, Uh and I actually took out the status updates of things that I wrote. So every chapter in the book starts with a status update that I wrote, and then the chapter talks about how much – why I wrote that status update and why that that was an important part of my life. I didn't want to be selfish where I just exchanged status updates about the album that I was listening to at that time. Mm -hmm. It was more about status updates of things that I said as a reflection of things that were going on in my life. So it was very equivalent when you go through that book of me sitting beside you and like opening up my phone, walking you through my Facebook and saying, let me tell you about what happened here. And even the chat messages that I had with people, I actually stripped that out of my Facebook and I put that right into the book. So you can literally see a, an illustration of the chat interactions happening. So I made it so personal where I use social media as an outlet to share the authentic story. So rather than Hollywooding it and pretending like something mm-hmm. glorious mm-hmm. happened, I share the raw story of exactly ha- what happened and I showed them screenshots of it along the way. That's freaking awesome. It was a fun experiment. And yeah. You know, it, it brings me back to my love for marketing where I got to be creative with it. I broke the rules of how to write a book. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to write it my own way. And the amount of feedback that I got from people that said it's so relatable because you took a very social media approach, like it's very millennial focused, yeah. where not only do they read it, but the adults that read it also pass it on to their kids. And I thought that was really interesting where now I just wanted to share my story, but it's being passed on by parents as well as parents that want their kids to understand that if you're going through a hard time, you can reinvent yourself and get out of it. Yeah, that is really creative. I, um, <clears throat> I think... The idea of connect again, it's like you've connected your real deeper experiences to what it's actually like for somebody today to be like on their freaking Facebook yes. or whatever. And it, so it makes a nice connection. And that's super cool. And where um, where can people get your book or how do they get it? Sure. If you end up attending any of my uh, speaking events, I usually have books handy with me. So if you come up and say hi, I'm always happy to sign a book and and make sure that you can go home with one. But my book is also available on Amazon right now. So Mm -hmm. .ca if you're in the Canadian side and .com if you're listening from the American side. And if you look at Project Reinvention, you can see you can get a sneak peek of a couple chapters and you can pick up the book from there as well. Nice. Yeah. So you still do you still contribute to that? website or whatever that you created uh, around I it? I don't, no? unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just, over time, I found better ways to get my story across. You know, I'm in the website business now yeah. as a marketer, and when yeah. I look back at the website, it was a disgusting site, man. <laughs> like, I had no website skills back in the days. I just had good stories, and I think yeah. the stories is what made the website get a lot of traffic. But it's something that I had to close down as a result of putting my efforts towards better things. Yeah. Rather than having an abandoned website, I wanted to drop the website and give my audience a better platform to connect with me. So social nice. media, I started a podcast as well called yeah. Ride With Me where I share some personal stories through audio and then my book allows me to share things in written words. So between those three um, formats, it really allows me to connect with different audiences be- based on how they like to learn. Wicked. And yeah, I guess in the... So every... There's a little backlog, but when the podca- when I upload the podcast to iTunes and the website and et cetera, we'll in- make sure to include all that information so people can find you there. Um, and I guess you will share it yeah, through your own and people you can find it through 
Mafuses as well. So I don't know. Is there anything else um, we should talk about that may or may not be helpful for? Yeah. I, I, so I think we dived into a lot. Yeah. Um, I also like the idea of um, not overwhelming the audience with too much information as well, but the core messages to encourage them to learn more. So if they want to learn more about us, I think it's an opportunity. Um, you know, this is going to be on the Ride With Me podcast as well. So I'd love for you to share uh, how people can connect with you if they want yeah. to learn more. Yeah, uh, I guess the easiest thing is starts with me.ca. Uh, there's a podcast link there. Um, and not, most of the social media links are on there as well. I think that's the best. Just send them one place and they can figure it out from there. Love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I've been on your website and you have tons of great resources um, yeah, really a great a opportunity resources. to learn about what your your value is, who your team members are, and how you guys get out there and where your next events are. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a great website. You said startswithme.ca? Yeah, startswithme.ca. Okay. Um, and what about – do you have anything uh, on the top of your mind that you have in the near future that – I just saw you did um, – uh, what is it like a startup challenge or a marketing yes. something yeah. or other? Yeah, do you I, have I anything was, like that? I was just in the um, yeah, we just did an event in Mississauga to help business owners uh, get started with their business. Yeah. So we were gonna consult them, give them some training, and then allow them to pitch to a panel. How and, is that? Sorry, I'm yeah. just curious how that did. Did Candy Box create that, or did you? We you got invited to do that. Like, how does that work? Interestingly, we've been talking about social media and reconnecting with human beings. Yeah. I actually got reached out on social media by someone that's been following me for a long time, and he has he operates a an incubator, a workspace in Mississauga, and he wanted to throw an event, and he thought I would be a really good fit for that to help him cool. with that event. So right when on. we got together. Um, I learned about his passion for Mississauga, and I wanted to support the city as much because Mississauga has been my home all my life. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy to get back to my Candy Box team, and we sponsored the event. And then we went out and we spoke at the panel there and gave them a presentation, and we got tons of great feedback. So it's a great community, man. I I always look for opportunities to get out there and connect with the Evolve, um, the evolution of a community. It's a big passion of mine. Um, For anyone that... uh, wants to keep up with where my upcoming events are. I have a few coming up, but I, I usually announce them closer to date just so I'm not over-promoting things. Yeah, sure. Um, follow me on Instagram. I think that's the best place yeah. because that's where I um, announce where the upcoming things are happening, whether it's a podcast episode like today's interview. I'm going to post about that shortly. Mm-hmm. just gives you an opportunity to keep up with our life. And my Instagram handle is mafuzc. That's M-A-H-F-U-Z-C. And if we connect there, um, send me a message. Messages is where it's at for me. I love to build authentic relationships. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. So I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I saw you post about sending people DMs. direct messages because yeah. I had been seeing that, like people discuss that a bit. And then I saw you post about it. And then I s- message you. I'm like, hey, you said to message you or whatever, send DMs. So I did. And then that that's was a how great tactic, man. With... You, you called me out. You were like, <laughs> you did. talked about I DMs. Yeah. I want to see if you mean it. Let's yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then yeah. you met up with me, which was really kind. And now here we are. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. And, yeah. Mike, you're an incredible individual, man. Everything Likewise, from the first time too. I've heard your story yeah. to the things that I've been keeping up with, with social media and just learning about you. Um, it's an absolute honor to be on your show, man. I've... It's such a great privilege to have this conversation with other individuals, and I appreciate the platform. Yeah, likewise. You too, man. Keep up the good work. And you've inspired me quite a lot today with some really insightful ideas and and suggestions and guidance and all kinds of cool things. So I guess that's about it. I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Till next time, everybody. Take care.